an introduction. It leaves me very little to say, so thanks very much. <laughs> Uh, first thing I want you to do is have a look around the room. If there's somebody near you that you don't know yet, introduce yourself, tell them where you're from, and tell them why you're here today. speak disparagingly of teachers and think about what a cushy job they've got and how long the holidays are, they really don't see exercises like this. And they don't see the people who stay awake at night thinking about how they can improve the learning for the students in their class. They don't see the after school meetings and conversations like the ones that we're going to have today. About one in every six of you is generous enough and brave enough to present the way in which you teach and learn to your colleagues. And that's quite extraordinary. So the very first thing I want to do is thank you all for coming here, and uh, I won't say welcome to the first day of the holidays again. <laughs> I just did. Um, I want to express um, for, uh, now my acknowledgement of the land on which we stand, particularly in the context of NAIDOC Week. Um, our Aboriginal brothers and sisters have been learning and living on this land uh, before recorded history. I want to put on record, even though Maria had to move off, our appreciation of ACU's making this space and the other rooms available to us during this period of time, a very generous uh, contribution. When I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, just by way of setting the tone, it struck me that Sometimes it's hard to keep all the ideas in our, in our learning statement. Of course, you should all be reaching into your pockets and pulling out your card as well. And if you don't have one, there are plenty out of exception. Um, giving something of a different spin. And, and really what I wanted to do today was talk about the seven C's of authentic learning, apologies for the bad pun. And uh, I just want to walk through some of these because I think it's not a bad way of connecting with all that we think is important about learning, with the kind of learning that's really going to allow our students, as our statement says, to live lives of promise and meaning in a rapidly changing world. And that's an expression that came from somebody in a school as we put the statement together. Lives of promise and meaning in a rapidly changing world. So our first C, challenge. Our students should be challenged. When we were developing the statement, one of the things that happened in workshops where I asked people to talk about what they understood by authentic learning was we got what I call the nice and fluffy bits, that it was creative, that it was engaging, that students saw the relevance, that it was fun. Sometimes it took us a while to get to the part that there were standards, that we looked for excellence, that there was challenge. And both of these are aspects of authentic learning. We really cannot have learning that's authentic if people are not being challenged, extended, moved to the next learning place. So we want our students to be challenged, not first and foremost, but among the things that we want. It's not just about having a good time and feeling good about it. In a time such as the one that we live today, where we find ourselves constantly astounded by what, by what communities can do to themselves, and by, the, and by the kinds of people who are shaping public opinion. And because it's safer, I'll comment on the US political scene, uh, not the Australian political scene. Um, 
But when somebody like a Donald Trump can garner support of people who have been through an education system, when somebody who can make assertions that have no basis in fact, and simply are based on a, an instinct that somehow a redneck like this can make the country great, we have a serious challenge in education. We have not made our students critical thinkers. And so authentic learning really has to position our students. You know, wouldn't it be terrific to say, no student of mine would vote for a Donald Trump? Now, we know that families have a significant influence here, but it will still be something we're aspiring to. The third C, our students are to be connected. Now, the obvious things to think about in our Catholic schools are connections with family, connections with parish. In our, in our schools more widely, particularly secondary schools, we talk about connections with other educational providers so that our young people come in contact with a broader range of people and experiences. With the advent of the technologies that we have at our disposal these days, young people be, can be connected with just about anybody. And so last year when I went to a teach me, one um, secondary teacher spoke about how they have connected their English class to a Shakespearean theatre group in England that went around schools. And they had conversations with the people in that group about the interpretation of a particular play. Now that's connection. But there's another connection, and that is a connection with the world that we live in. So in order to exercise a critical faculty about people like Trump, we actually need to be aware of what's going on. And secondly, we want learning that connects with what Jerry Starrett calls the trajectory of our students' lives. So that we want our learning to be connected, to be relevant, if you like. It's the point of engagement. We are increasingly aware that learning, while it has an individual dimension, also, uh, I have swapped my slides around on this one, sorry, I'll, I'll go back, I'll run back up again. In the times in which we work as teachers, there is perhaps an overemphasis on the quantifiable, an overemphasis on external testing, a sense that the only way to respond to those kinds of pressures and accountabilities is by uh, regurgitation, sometimes and less glamorously known as chew and skew, as a way to um, succeed in the educational rat race. It would appear to me that if we're conspiring with the creation of something that might be called a rat race, we're really in the wrong business. And so the kinds of learning that we want our young people to be engaged with are le the kinds of learning that engage their creative side, where they are um, focusing on real world situations in which they're asked to go outside the square. We want open-ended tasks and we want people who will generate new solutions, not simply feed back the ones that we've already had. The individual aspect of learning is something that we are familiar with. We're, we're comfortable with that. And we talk about learning as a group that Sometimes we think about it as a way in which a group can help individuals to learn. But as we come to understand society and organisations better, we are learning that, in fact, groups have a way of learning. So the group itself is a learning place. And we need to um, have people who understand how that works. So as we ask young people to collaborate, one of the challenges we have is that they should be doing a form of mental learning about that. They should learn what it is to learn in a group. They should learn what it is to contribute to learning as a group. They should learn what it is to shape the learning of a group. And that can begin from kindergarten. And I've seen some fabulous examples. And sometimes we just take that for granted. So circumstances where, from the very earliest age, children learn about organising a space for learning in a group the right kind of voice to use for learning in a group, particularly when there are other groups learning in the group. How to manage an agenda. 
these are all dimensions of learning that if it is going to be authentic, people are going to develop and going to need to develop going forward. And the last of my, uh, sorry, the second last of my seven C's is that our young people should be capable learners. And that's shorthand for learners who have a sense of their own efficacy. Learners who don't rely on the teacher's opinion or the teacher's instruction for the next step and don't need to be constantly externally validated. Now that doesn't happen by accident. And this is perhaps one of the more subtle and sophisticated things that we need to do as teachers, which is to give young people a sense of the way in which they're learning and how they're learning. So they don't rely on your feedback to know whether what they've done is any good. One of the things we can do around that is to make space for risk for kids in their learning and to minimise the consequences of failure. So if students feel the world's come to an end because they didn't get the right answer, they're highly unlikely to develop a sense that they're in control of their learning. And that leads me to my last C, that the choice makers. It's far more likely that students will feel that they're capable learners if they're making choices about the what of their learning, the how of their learning. What we need to do is provide the why of the learning inside which they make those choices. And we need to encourage them to bring together their other faculties, their creativity, their critical thinking, their collaboration, all of those in order to make decisions about the directions they want to follow. That can't happen unless we have a good relationship with our students. Yeah. Time and time again we hear people reminding us that teaching is about relationship. Without a relationship of trust, learners will not feel free to make choices or they'll make the choice that they think you want. And that's really not taking it any further forward. And what I wanted to do is finish with two further scenes. I actually thought about these as I was listening to uh, a podcast uh, on the TED radio hour as I came in here on the train this morning. So for those of you who are waiting to see the Malala Yousafzai clip that's uh, that's in the uh, slideshow. The bit I wanted to show you started at 14 minutes and 37 seconds. It's actually written on the slide. But I want to finish with two C's for teachers. Doesn't have the same poetic ring as the seven C's for learners. The podcast I was listening to was called Nudge. And it's about the notion that one of the ways in which we can bring change about is, is by providing small nudges and of the right kind to carry people on in a direction they wanted to go in anyway but didn't realise. And uh, in it there was an interview with a uh, psychiatrist who dealt in addictions and he talked about making people curious. So curious is my first seat of teachers. He deals with addicts and so instead of telling people not to do things, he says be curious about your smoking or your heroin addiction or whatever it happened to be. Ask yourself about it. What did it feel like when I did this? What did it taste like when I did this? Why do I think I did this at this stage? And I thought, wouldn't that be great if that's what we did as teachers, that we became more mindful of our practice so that we stopped and asked ourselves, what difference did it make when I did this instead of that? Sometimes we call that reflective practice. So let's be curious. And that's about what I do in my own capacity. Because as I become more aware of what's actually going on, my values are going to come to bear. And I'm hoping that the values will authentic learning world. And the second point that I wanted to draw to your attention is conversation. That it's not enough that I look after my own professional practice, that I have a responsibility and I will benefit from the professional practice of others. So talk to other people, ask them the, the same kinds of questions, share the things that you've been reading. Talk to the willing and talk to the unwilling. In this morning's prayer we had, so I send you out, Jesus said them out. Well, in a sense, 
learning something we can be evangelical about. And I guess the model of Catholics can't be evangelical, nobody can. So if we're going to make a difference for our 72,000 kids, it's a group like this that's going to spread the word among their colleagues. So you can make a difference. Be explicit about what you're doing. Be proud of what you're doing. Connect to others by all the means that are possible so that you could, we can have this kind of conversation many times over. If each of you made it a point to talk to three other people when you went back to school after the holidays about something you had learned here today, you'd make a tremendous difference. So let me wish you well for the rest of the day. Uh, I'm sure that um, you will all, as I will, look forward to listening to Mark and indeed to engaging with your colleagues in the workshops. And thank you very much for coming on the first day of the holidays. <laughs>